The year was 1986, and I was still involved with the production of a band called Y Axis, based in Metro Boston, Massachusetts. The band that year had undergone some substantial changes that posed a great challenge for me at the time. For one, we had just lost our drummer, Little Joe Thomas, on account of the fact that he didn't have enough time to make rehearsals due to his obligations as Bat Boy for the Boston Red Sox that year. Little Joe's father, Big Joe, was still the pseudo-manager for the band though, and continued to help facilitate its continuance. Even purchasing a new Korg DW6000 synthesizer for my use that very same year. I remained paired up with infamous Arthur Lever, a guitarist, songwriter, and vocalist from Somerville, Massachusetts. Together with my abilities as keyboardist, producer, and vocals, the two of us decided to take on what ended up being a humongous task of putting together a two-piece act by ourselves. The plan was hatched between the two of us to go out and play live, bringing along a fully produced backup band with us. The backup band would be me and Arthur recorded on multi-track tape. The idea was that we would selectively sing and play our instruments live as a two-piece, but have our own drum tracks by way of the new digital drum machines and backup tracks laid down ahead of time behind us on multi-track tape. Believe it or not, this concept was actually ahead of its time in 1986 because the technology that makes this commonplace today, MIDI, the musical instrument digital interface, was just in its infancy back then and it was not readily available in its fully functional form as it is today. So the main technology at the time was analog tape and what was known as onboard sequencers, which was just a basic ability of a keyboard to store some notes in memory and spit them back out in step time. So most of the work of the Y-axis two-piece was all in the production and editing of the multi-track backup tracks. We had all heard about the Nilly Vanilli scandal that happened later in the 80s, about the two vocalists who didn't even sing their own tracks. This project was nothing like that. Live or on tape, this was all me and infamous author to the very last note. It was decided between myself and infamous author that we would first put together a 40 song cover show to take out and play clubs and venues where we could bring home a paycheck. Then after that became established, move on to the originals which were really both of our mainstay and focus. The full weight of producing the show fell on my shoulders as producer engineer and it soon became apparent that the intensity and time-sensitive nature of the project would all but consume me. Infamous author tried to alleviate the pressure by allowing me to quit my day job and spend full time on the production in an effort to squeak it out as quickly as possible. As he worked full time for Harvard University's food services, he was able to offset some of my personal expenses. It was obvious that this financial pressure, together with the loans we took out to purchase the recording equipment, was going to play into the success or failure of Y-axis. I remember thinking as the time waned on, with the production still not finished, how long could we last without a paying gig? Commuting up to Westford, Massachusetts, where the recording was taking place, and working up guitar and vocal parts for 40 songs was hard enough for Arthur while working full time. But it was the lesser of two evils when you consider that I was responsible for learning all the keyboard and vocal parts, as well as programming the digital drum machine, sequencers, and then recording it all track by track, one at a time on the multi-track machine, to the tune of 40 songs from scratch. Did I really think two guys could do all this and be ready to play out in six months? History speaks for itself, but there still was excitement between me and Arthur about being the first out of Boston to bring this new concept to the live club scene. In 1986, infamous Arthur Lever and I purchased a Tascam 388 multi-track tape machine. At the time, it seemed like a great idea to munch down eight tracks onto one quarter inch tape. There was onboard DBX noise reduction to help get rid of any unwanted tape hiss, and an eight channel mixer with parametric EQ ability. For Y axis, this was a great money saver because we could use the mixer portion of the machine when we went out to play out live as well. Purchased about the same time was the Korg DDM-110 digital drum machine. Primitive by today's sequencers, 
but however lousy the sample drums actually were, to us it was better than having no drummer at all. We sweetened the recorded tracks using an Alesis Microverb 2 one half rack reverb unit and enlarged the vocals using an Ibanez digital delay processor. Arthur laid down the guitar tracks on his Fender Stratocaster and we both sung lead and backup vocals for every song. I still had the Korg Poly 800 and the Korg DW6000 synthesizer and forced out every patch to come as close to the original cover tune as I could. Today you could achieve the same thing by downloading a MIDI file from the internet or plugging in your karaoke machine and singing along. But in 1986, this was state of the art. Here are some of the results of those efforts in 1986.
Many of the theme songs for this television program were written and produced by Peter Keyes Berwin who writes songs before they become hits for the commercial music industry. Now with over 400 songs in catalog unpublished and available, stream Peter Keyes Berwin music at any of the websites shown on the screen. This program was partially produced in cooperation with the New England Music Mill Rehearsal Complex, the home of many of New England's premier bands and musicians. For band and musician rehearsal space, contact the phone number or website shown on the screen.